Hi, I'm Rebecca Caseman, and I am a sculptor. I do uh, ceramics and installation. This is Reclamations. It is a immersive installation, which means it's best viewed in the midst of it. One of the things with immersive installations is that because you have to be in the middle of it to really start to get a read of it and to really start to understand it, that also applies to me as an artist. And so I'm still working through my mindset in here and, and how I'm bringing apart our, about all the elements. Um, and I think that's one of the, the beautiful things about an installation is as you're going through it you get to make your mind up about different things you get to read it your own way you get to understand it your own way I'm certainly guiding you with the things that I've made but it's up to you to decide how you're going to react to it so these are mostly hanging sculptures and they are a mix of different media um, these ones here and the ones above are made of the same. And then these are bent bandsaw blades that I have manipulated and then contained in the form with just yarn. I wanted to use something that seems like it shouldn't be able to hold it in its form. And the pressure of the wire is constantly fighting against the containment of it. They lend a sort of chaos to it, which is always something that I'm looking for because my work is always about those things that happen in life that we're not prepared for. Usually the things that knock us to our knees. Those things like uh, the death of someone we love or coming home from war or being in the middle of it or abuse, rape, trauma, being a caregiver for someone you love. Those moments when we don't really know how to process those emotions that we have and they're so big that we don't have a good word for them. So in this particular installation, I'm really wanting to talk about what's happening after. Right after something traumatic happens, usually we're surrounded by family and community and, and they rally around us, but over time, because life happens, that starts to trickle away and it's, a, it's not malicious, it's not careless, it's just the way life moves. And so the people who have been through those moments, those, those experiences, are then left feeling isolated and alone and that if a month after their mom dies they're still crying, they feel shame of sorts because they should be over it or they should be able to deal with it better than they have or they seem to be at that moment. And so I really want to talk about how as individuals we can address that and how as society we can address that so that it becomes okay to say I'm having a bad day and that we learn compassion and empathy and the ability to be understanding with each other in a way that I, I don't necessarily know that in this sped up society that we're good at. The pieces that are in the corners, there's the single one here that's broken and then there's a pile of them on the other side. Those are representing that feeling of isolation that you get, the, especially if you've been through a a traumatic event where it was something that happened to you, that happened to your body, there's a, a feeling of brokenness. And societally sometimes there's this perception of brokenness and that somehow you've lost your use in some way. And so the cut on it, the tear on it, is really trying to address that and then how isolated in that a person can feel um, and how separated they feel from the people who seem to not have anything going on. I always choose materials that on their own are fallible. And by that I mean they can fall apart or break or, or not work out the way you intended right from the beginning. I started, I started out all of my art at the beginning with ceramics and, and what I really loved about it was I could suggest what I wanted the clay to do but at any point in the making, the firing, the glazing, uh, something could go wrong and it's just not going to turn out. 
And I really liked how that played with life, how we have these mentalities that it's going to, we're going to do this, then this, and this, and it's all going to work out because we did the right steps. And it mimics life in a really beautiful way in that. So I started with ceramics, which I have some pieces on the floor here. And with these, I took a giant slab of clay and I just laid it over a form and then I let it dry. And as it dried, it shrunk and, and started to crack and break. And I just kind of let it do whatever it was going to do. And then I s gently took it off the mold and fired it. And however they broke in the kiln was what I accepted as what I would use. The glazes also that I use, I choose ones that are really volatile. So if they go on too thick, they bubble over like lava. If they go on too thin, um, they may go a weird color that I don't enjoy. And so there's this, there's this wonderful level of unpredictability that whatever I get out of the kiln, I just have to work with. I have to figure out how to make it beautiful. I have to figure out how to, how to make it work or what I can do with it next that might bring out the beauty that is inherent in it. After I, after I'd worked in clay for a while, I started to really think about the fact that I wanted to build bigger. I wanted to create things that could hang. I wanted to create things that didn't require a giant kiln since I was graduating. And so I started researching into materials that I could use that if they were layered, I could create these forms that mimicked that same movement that clay has. Clay has this wonderful, beautiful organic movement. As you're moving it, your fingerprints stick in it, and, and whatever you do to it, it's recorded. And so I wanted to try and play with that on a larger scale. But I wanted to use materials that, that I could push to their breaking point and then, and then kind of stop it at that point. And so I spent the entire summer playing with different layering processes. And I ended up with all of these forms, they were, they start with chicken wire. And I just bend and manipulate until it feels, it feels right, <laughs> which I don't know, I can't explain what that is, but it feels right. And then I start hacking at it with wire clippers. Once I get it to a point where I think I can start to do something more, I started layering uh, plaster gauze over it and then what it started to do was it, it would reveal itself. It revealed its areas where the holes came through and where I could see different elements because when it's chicken wire it's all see-through and so when I started putting the skin on it I got to see where those beautiful moments of uh, intrigue and interest started to show up and I could accentuate them. After I did the plaster gauze then I would cut away some more to reveal to to start to accentuate even more those, those wonderful moments of um, dissension in the piece and to create a more vulnerable feel like this here, feeling more vulnerable. And once I finally got it to the point where I was happy with the shape, um, then I would coat it with a paper mache paste that has a lot of plaster in it and sand it down and let it be. And I intentionally left moments where you can see all the different layers because I treat my materials, I treat my art the same way I communicate with people. The more you look, the more you spend time with someone, the more you get to know them and you get to understand who they are, what makes up who they are, how they got to be the person that they are. And so I really wanted to draw focus to that in the materials that if we spend time slowing down and spending time with each other, then we'll start to understand why a person is who they are. And, and hopefully that will increase that empathy and compassion and thoughtfulness with each other. The spheres on the, around the room, those are a mix of the plaster gauze and the paper mache paste. Um, but in reverse, I would coat a, uh, either an exercise ball or a balloon, frankly, in paper mache paste, and then I would let it dry and it would crack in different spots as it shrunk. And then on some of them, I would put a coating of the plaster gauze just to give it a little bit of strength, especially on the very large ones. 
because as they got bigger, they became more and more fragile, and the minute you touched them, they started to disintegrate. And while I really enjoy that, that element, uh, it lacks functional, functionality for transport and things like that. So I did leave it on the edges. I made sure and kept the plaster lower so that, so that you could still see that breaking away and um, allow for some of that destruction. Uh, I included an audio of just me breathing. And my thought at the time was I'm going to start it out as just me breathing regular. And then it would move into how it felt, you know, th that moment when you wake up from a bad dream or you get bad news and it's that, <laughs> that moment that just stops your heart and stops your breath. And, uh, and so I honestly, I, I just sat on my couch and I recorded this. And I wanted it to feel raw. I wanted it to feel like you were listening into that moment that is so quiet because I think I think what happens is when we're dealing with pain, it's all so silent outside. We don't feel like people are hearing the, the catch in our throat that's constant and the, the ragged breathing that we constantly feel. And so for me to accentuate it in the space is almost, it's drawing attention to the fact that while um, people may walk around looking like they're okay, their head may be constant noise and their breathing may be hard and it may be just hard for them to do the day. Um, and I wanted that to really be a good representation of that, that what's going on inside is not always represented outside. And that's why we need to spend more time understanding each other. As far as my making process, I, I tend to I tend to stick towards who I am. And so the way I interact with people is to spend time with them and get to know them and see what makes them um, tick, to respond to their body language, to respond to what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing. And in the same way that I do that, I respond to my work. I don't plan ahead what a form is going to be. I start to make, and then I respond to what it's doing. If the wire pushes back really hard in a certain way, then I back up. And there's always this, this push and pull, this play back and forth where I'm reading the material and responding to it, not forcing it to be what I demand it be. And, it's, and I, I make the way I live the way I am, the way I parent. All of it is the same. And I believe that that authenticity of who I am is, is how I create the work that I do. It's about that relationship between people and material and, and reading and understanding what's going on around me and then letting it play out and really celebrating the beauty you can find in all of it, whether it be bad or good. And that's, that's not that, uh, it's not one of those, those platitudes where it's like, all oh, bad things are great. They're not. Some of them are just bad and they're awful. But what we can do is we can, we can take it back. And that's why it's called reclamations, is it's not saying bad things are great, it's okay, just be happy. It's these things happen, but you can reclaim it. You can make it into what you want. You can, you can take what you've learned from it, take what happened, and, and it's yours then to decide what you want to do with it and how you want to respond to it. And so this work is really trying to create that conversation of how do we, on a personal level, ourselves, and as society as a whole, take those moments that are hard, take those moments that are sometimes absolutely brutal and say, okay, what do we want to do with it now? How do we make this better? How, how do we not make the circumstance better, but how do we make society better? How do we make the things that happen, something positive come out of them, for, that, for those that come later and for us ourselves.